then we might get into something. But sometimes it doesn't work because it's quite difficult to define what is cost and what is benefit. <coughs> We've done this, uh, Town and I did this with your data sets in, in the weeks prior, and we discussed a lot. <coughs> and I think we didn't get to, to a clear cut answer. I mean, nothing that can be demonstrated in a mathematical way, but still, we got somewhere. And I show you what we got. Where basically it, we, it is where we are, except that town decided to go away from it for very good reasons, mostly. <coughs> town prepared a series of data sets in which the quadrat side was increasingly larger. Okay? Or increasingly smaller, I don't remember. You started to two or five degrees and then went down to fractional degrees. <coughs> and we looked at the density per unit area, how many records were available per unit area. So it's not how many records per tile or per, per sample, but per square meter or square kilometer or whatever. And uh, it turns out that the larger the quadrat, the smaller, the smaller the number of records per unit area. This is a typical consequence of a clumped distribution. But it's also interesting to note that normally you, you would expect, remember, we are comparing expectations with observations. We expect that the larger the area, the higher the variance. Except in an ideal, ideal world, which is the Poisson distribution, a completely random system. A completely random distribution will have a fixed variance. A non-random distribution will have an ever-increasing variance. And this is what happened with the data. The larger the quadrant area, the larger the variance. But we had to reduce the variance to variance per unit area, because the variance it will always be larger if you have more data. So we divided the variance by the square of the area. Variance is a quadratic measure. You can't divide by the area. You have to divide by the square of the area. <coughs> and then we found this set of relatively straight lines very much as we, expect, as we could expect if we had a clumped distribution with lots of gaps in it. A clumped distribution means that you have the gaps. All right? Now the question is, how do we maximize the benefit? What is the magic square size that will give us the most information at the least cost? Well, the density per unit area, uh, sorry, this, this is wrong. It shouldn't say here density. It's actually change in variance. What we looked at is something that you don't see easily here, but is these lines are not really straight. They, are, they have bumps. And if we plot the slope of the variance as it increases with area, I mean the amount of change, not the actual variance, not the actual variance per unit area, but the amount of change when you go from one size to another size, you increase the size of the sample, you increase the variance. But how much? Sometimes you increase it little, sometimes you increase it more. So what we want to look at is that size at which the increase in variance is comparatively low. I mean, you move to one size to another size and you see that the area doesn't increase. What it means? It means that at that point, your distribution is more random than clumped, which means that you are getting rid of gaps. <coughs> and it turns out that there was a characteristic size that for most data sets, except for Cameroon, the change in variance with unit area was lower. So quadrats smaller than this were one thing, quadrats larger than this were a different thing, and quadrats about this size, actually those are three, it's a family of three sizes, are farther away from either a clump distribution with lots of gaps or a non-visible distribution because you are taking enormous chunks with lots of data on it. So on a whim, 
we guessed, and this is a guess and this is an assumption, we haven't published it and probably will never <laughs> because we need a lot of mathematics, uh, mathematical analysis, but we guessed that this size is the right size for, our, for your data. This size coincides almost perfectly with what Town, using his own feeling, had decided what would be the right size before doing the analysis. So we can take this as a confirmatory analysis, more or less. So basically, whatever I want to do in science, I should just do it? Uh, no. <laughs> At least uh, put me as a co-author. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Um, Something happened at this size that made those quadrats closer to randomness than to clump distribution gaps or to no visible or no discernible pattern, large quadrats, right? So we decided to go over here. And uh, if you want to go beyond, but I haven't done it, uh, we can <coughs> go again, revisit our species accumula accumulation curve. So. A small area will yield a few, uh, a, a small number of species or O2. A larger area will get more, a large, even larger area will get you more O2, but eventually this will flatten out. Eventually, or ideally. ideally. <coughs> so, what we should do is try to set a stopping criterion. Which one? There are several stopping criteri criteria have been published, such as see how much you have to increase the area to increase a fixed number of O2s or one single O2 more or whatever. Basically, you try to guess when flat, what flattening means, as we saw in the morning. And then you stay at that size. For instance, here could be one idea. And then look at how many voids you find there. Or you can try to do it more formally. That's what we did for a parameter, which is at each diversity, Shannon's diversity. <coughs> we took a number of samples, shuffled them, and, and looked at how diversity increased with increasing area, with increasing number of samples. But this is just the center line of a distribution of curves that changed according to which sample enters first the analysis, as we saw in the morning. The interesting thing here is that in many cases, you might try to see what is the slope of this curve? And then you can have a fast and solid, solid in the sense that it provides you a, a frame of reference, a solid criterion about when to stop. We decide to use this criterion. When the slope of this curve was not significantly, and by significantly I mean statistically different from zero, we decided that no further sampling was necessary. Why? Because statistically, uh, an increase in the area would not give significant differences from the data we had collected before. So that's a easily formalized criterion, which might be right or might be wrong, but gives you some kind of, <coughs> of uh, um, fallback method or some kind of um, uh, scapegoat in case something goes wrong. You can say, okay, I did this like this because it's mathematically correct, and if anything goes wrong, just blame Arturo or blame mathematics or blame whatever, right? <coughs> One thing that we need quite often and in, in which for which we need to analyze gaps often also is baselines. A baseline is the state of knowledge about something. How many species are known from a site, for instance, or how many sites have been sampled. And it's very useful to have a baseline because you can see changes. We are now so concerned with climate change. Do we have a baseline against which to compare our findings in terms of biodiversity with findings before climate change? For that, we need data. If we do have a baseline, we might do the comparisons. If we don't have the baseline, then comparisons might be quite hard to come by. So a baseline, having a baseline is quite useful to detect also additional gaps. And it's useful to direct further work. 
Normally, a baseline is set by using a, a data gap analysis, by setting up a data gap analysis. So basically, you try to do it fast first. You try to consult databases. You try to see whether there are historical data available. If there are historical data available, then you might set a baseline, how things were known at that particular point of time. If not, well, you can resolve to something a little bit more complex, which could be, for instance, Czech literature. Well, actually, I will make a small insert here. You should always consult literature and try never to trust database, databases, okay? <coughs> but don't make the mistake to trust literature, literature over everything else. Papers can go wrong, too. Okay, you consult literature, you see if a baseline exists in the literature, then you're set. If not, you have to go <coughs> further down the road, try to collect expert judgment, try to set the baseline anyway, and if anything fails, then do a data gap analysis that will actually become your baseline. What is a data gap analysis? Data gap analysis is basically the summary of what we've seen so far. We try to find gaps, we try to find ways to fill gaps. A data gap analysis <coughs> has a workflow which has been defined like this in a, in a forthcoming paper in GBIF <coughs> that entails first scoping the analysis setting the expectations, remember, we compare things that we find with things that we expected. We try to assess how many data, data we have available. We try to map expectations against availability. We try to identify data gaps then, and then go into trying to make these results available to everyone and do political things such as prioritize gap closing, etc. And at the end of everything, you check your own exercise, whether it was right, it was wrong, it can be redone or has to be changed okay, uh, for the next instance. <coughs> there are several methods to do this, and some, some of them, well, all of them have, have both advantages and disadvantages. Some of them are very resource intensive, such as database analysis, whereas trying to do a survey is normally resource less or has, uh, consumes less resource. The costs can be high if you have to get hold of literature and you don't have really access to them. <coughs> Normally the cost of asking somebody something, unless it's a consultant, is quite low, so unless it's done. <coughs> <coughs> Some of them are difficult to, to perform. Some of them are, can be highly reliable, but a, stake, a stakeholder survey, it depends on who are you surveying. Etc. And uh, I'd like to point you that the likelihood of being wrong in a data gap analysis is also dependent on the method you've, you're following. Normally, a good literature review should give you good results in terms of whether there is a baseline or not. And a database analysis is error prone because you are relying, as Tom said yesterday, on whether the guy putting the data into the data set is reliable or not. Mm? So there's a risk here in terms of error likelihood <coughs> with database analysis. There are tools and resources that can be used for data gap analysis. Uh, there are many, many techniques, but basically they always boil down to GIS for creative use of GIS for geographical analysis or speed sheets for other kind of, of analysis database management, database uh, mongering, <coughs> using statistical packages for testing your hypothesis, such as R or whatever, or trying to use te uh, visualization techniques. We humans are very good at detecting patterns, so we try to try to visualize anything. There are a number of visualization tools available that can help you do this, this set of data, of data analysis, and <coughs> I think we might have perhaps time to see one of, or two of them, of, of those, like Bitsat or Vesper, which is much more recent, or even GBF Sound dashboard. Or you simply have fun doing your own plots, as we saw over these days. Could I go through one of those two? <coughs> okay. 
This is a tool that is based basically in my prototypes that were then developed into uh, an application by Javier Otegui, my, <coughs> my PhD student, which now has become extremely more proficient than I. <laughs> so if I, if I blunder here, it's my fault, not Javier's fault, OK? <coughs> so this data, set, this data set analysis you have available, basically analysis GBF data. This version I have here is the prototype version, so it's fixed up to 2012 <coughs> because uh, new, <coughs> new tools are able to do that directly on, on the current index. Basically what it does is it looks at how the data of a particular provider or a particular data set are distributed over time, space or taxonomy. So let's say that so we... I apologize. <laughs> okay. What I did before was just clicking the link, okay? <coughs> so let's suppose that we want to analyze the botanical garden in Berlin, Dalhem, and uh, uh, we might select one of the data sets or simply not no one, I think. And here we have a number of visualization that describes that describe how these data are distributed. Mm -hmm. For instance, this is a very simple visual visualization that if, if it works, because I know that today Javier was working with this, and probably it's offline. It might be offline, I'm not, I'm not sure. <coughs> so we'll have this the typical demo effect. <coughs> But some of the visualizations I showed you in the previous two hours came from Bitset. Okay. Um, I don't know whether it's the network or my computer or the server. Can any of you please copy uh, just this? Oh, okay, it worked. Hmm? Okay, this one simply uh, examines what is the origin of records. In this case, in Berlin, everything is basically herbarium sheets, as you see, specimens. Some other are observation, living, etc. And other visualizations we might have here is just a distribution map. It's very well done by GBF itself. I don't know why it's not here. Nothing is wrong here. Perhaps they don't have any, <coughs> any coordinate, which is something I don't really expect. Or, again, this has gone awry. Or this is one of the time plots that we saw yesterday that represents the day of month against the month. And we see when the data were basically recorded, basically from April to October. With a particularly heavy day, June 11th, I have absolutely no idea why there are so many sheets marked as belonging to the, the 11th of June. Hmm? Clearly because of that. Because what? My parents were married that day. <laughs> that explains everything then. <clears throat> or a tree map of the taxonomy. In the morning we saw a tree map, a tree map of records, how many records we had available for a specific, uh, for, for each uh, taxon group. <clears throat> it's downloading. This one is quite heavy. Come on, come up. Okay, this is a trim up of the taxonomy. I'm going to reduce the size so it fits 